Okay, folks, so we are covering our last unit for the entirety of the race unit, which is um, racism, or what I'm calling racism 2.0. Uh, part of the focus is going to be unpacking um, white supremacy as a concept and then looking at um, the kind of effects of racism across various social fields. Um, we'll revisit this a lot as we get into some of the specific um, histories of the or histories and realities of the historically for marginalized communities again, which are African American, Latinx, and Chicanx communities, Native American, and Asian American. Um, I'm going to put a lot of data on this. Uh, so as you're parsing through this lecture, uh, I would you know probably focus on just listening to what is said um, and then reviewing the infographics presented. Um, uh, later on, um, partly because it is a lot of information. And as we've been kind of talking about over the past few weeks, um, race and racism are very entrenched in our society and it has kind of wide reaching effects. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on with this lecture was to really give you a broad swath of all of the ways in which um, racism kind of um, harms individuals and, and how it touches all of these various elements of our society, which is also kind of akin to why when we're thinking about institutional racism, systemic racism, scientific medical racism, some of the other concepts that we talked about on uh, or in the last lecture, this will help kind of flush that out a bit further. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and we'll get into the material. So um, So just to kind of keep with the general framework, right, we're going to be looking at, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit ahead. So um, what we're going to be covering today is white supremacy. And I'm going to provide a cycle. Um, and I think this model is going to be helpful in terms of understanding how um, racism continues to operate in our society. If you remember back to the racial formations reading, I talked about this, or the racial formations lecture, I talked a little bit about this in terms of race making. Um, we also see this reproducing with white supremacy as well. Um, we're gonna look at the legacy of racism and I'm gonna provide one specific historical example that I think is gonna help flesh this out a bit. Um, we're gonna look at how racism manifests and then obviously the effects of racism and we're gonna look at it across these various fields. So education, criminal justice, politics, healthcare and housing. Uh, and then the future of racism where we're gonna talk about um, colorblind racism specifically. And um, so I wanted to present the term white supremacy um, because it is in, inexorably connected to this, the discussion of racism in the US. Um, if we remember back to the way in which we think about race and racial difference in the United States um, and through most of the Western world, so Europe and so on and so forth, um, it has been constructed by you know whites to basically um, distance themselves from communities of color and in doing so, um, they have essentially denigrated the social and humanistic position of uh, people of color um, specifically to exploit them, right? So whether that be through slavery, um, through you know, other means of economic exploitation from land removal, um, so on and so forth, all of that is kind of entrenched in this. And what we need to understand about racism today is that it is very much anchored to the sense of white supremacy. And what I mean by that is um, all of the racial slurs that um, are put out there, the effects of um, discrimination, all of that, for the most part, it stems from this, I this ideology of, white of whiteness as being above all else and all other individuals being less than. So even when we think about inter-ethnic um, discrimination, so like anti-Blackness in um, Latino communities or like anti-Latino anti sentiments and Asian American communities, whatever that looks like, oftentimes those communities did not necessarily have that language to begin with. Rather, um, they kind of adopted the message from the oppressor, essentially whites, um, and then reproduce that, right? So when, um, you know, various communities of color use racial epithets or racial slurs against other groups, that is not something that they had uniquely of themselves, rather that they came to learn that um, socially and adopt that socially through their interactions with white supremacy. And um, if you remember back to the kind of pyramid scheme of power that we've been talking about with whiteness at the top and blackness at the bottom, essentially 
all of the groups in between are trying to jockey to be as close to whiteness as possible, essentially to get more access to resources and goods, right? So if a community of color can say, I'm not as bad as X community, then they can make the substantive argument that they should have more status and privilege. Think back to the thinned example that we talked about in racial formations. Thin wanted to make himself white as a citizen, so that way he could become a citizen one. And many of the arguments that he used to kind of achieve that um, symbolic whiteness and make himself legally white was to say that he was of a genealogical origin that was white, i.e. Caucasoid, and then B, um, because of his high caste um, Hindu status, he made the argument that he does not, you know, favor or interact or even, you know, um, copulate or, you know, have relations with um, poor, poor, darker skin and or Aboriginal um, peoples, right? So essentially, you know, he kind of comes from a creed of pure breedingness, right? Which is essentially whiteness. And so that, again, has been kind of doled out over time. And that framework now manifests in all of these other social societies where, or these other institutions in our society where essentially they privilege whites and um, all other people of color face different types of negative consequences or don't have the same um, social outcomes or the same outcomes as whites do. So what this turns into is this cycle, as I mentioned earlier. So um, just so we have a clear understanding, white supremacy is the belief that all white people are superior to those of other races and should thus dominate them. This belief favors the maintenance and defense of white power and privilege. Um, much of what you read in the article for this week about the possessive investment in whiteness comes from this idea. And what Lipsis is arguing in this chapter is that essentially whites are um, beset on trying to maintain their whiteness and uh, not give up any status or privilege as it become as it becomes more and more aware that they are become or they are privileged, right? So, uh, for example, um, a lot of the attacks against ethnic studies, and we saw this with Precious Knowledge, is that um, when we show that uh, white knowledge, white history is oppressive and deleterious, um, rather than um, whites accepting that reality. Um, they try to challenge it and say that it is actually in and of itself racist, which um, the, the critiques of CRT uh, of being racist or the critiques of ethnic studies being racist is ludicrous, essentially, right? Because what ethnic studies is doing is saying, look, here is a full history from all of these different perspectives being much more democratic and inclusive than what you are already presenting. That is not what has been happening. Um, however, uh, by and large, um, you know, we see those kinds of attacks when we see um, uh, conversations about um, social welfare, right, unemployment, housing benefits, um, student debt relief, any of those things, any handouts that come for, um, you know, historically marginalized communities, um, whites are usually the first to um, kind of balk at that or, or question it and argue that it's taking away from them, right, that it's harming them in some way, even though there's no clear evidence of, of that, right? And so we want to be very clear that one, white supremacy is an ideology, uh, again, this kind of theory of knowledge or this, this way of seeing the world through, you know, various political and economic lenses. And um, the way this is structured is that um, whites are unchallenged, right? So if we go back to that dominant group versus minority group framework, so whites are unchallenged, all of what they kind of experience is considered commonplace. Any outside perspective is considered to be foreign. And if that starts to, and if those um, foreignized, marginalized, or you know, minoritized, racialized individuals start to contest that in some way, then uh, whites will essentially push back against that, right? They'll, they'll take the extra steps to ensure that their status and privilege is maintained, or i.e., you know, they'll possessively invest in this idea of whiteness, right? So white supremacy, again, has roots in the now, you know, kind of discredited doctrine of scientific racism and was a key justification in colonialism. And remember back that Carl Linnaeus and other thinkers like him, Samuel Morton, so on and so forth, um, were very similarly minded as the church. The church heathenized, um, you know, people of color were scientists inferiorized people of color. And in both cases, that uh, 
justification or that construction of people of color as less than um, enabled colonization, right? You don't deserve your land, so we'll take them from you. You don't deserve to be free, we will enslave you. You don't deserve to be here, we will eradicate you, so on and so forth. So it follows this kind of logic. So the model here starts with this, again, this idea of white supremacy so that whites are above all else. It creates this idea of ideological and social racism. So the belief structure and a social system structured in racism where, again, whites are considered to be superior and all people of color are considered to be less than. They'll con then that leads to the construction of institutional racism. So um, politics, uh, policing, educational systems, so on and so forth that privilege whites. This creates the system of wide ranging and interconnected prejudices. So um, school officials, um, uh, police officers, governmental officials, whoever that is, will be prejudicial towards people of color, ensuring that they don't um, get access to the same kinds of goods as um, people of color, or I'm sorry, as white folks. And then we have all of this type of um, discrimination, right, across all of these different boundaries. And because of this discrimination and because of the inferiorized status of people of color, um, it then justifies white supremacy because then folks believe across all boundaries, as we saw with internalized racism, um, that people of color are considered to be less than, right? So um, let's think about the legacy of this, right? So uh, again, this isn't brand new, this is entrenched in our society. And if we go back to the understanding of the 1619 versus the Columbus argument about the origins of racism, um, the uh, the construction of race has been going on for about you know roughly five to six hundred years, right? Either from 1619 or 1492, so pretty big in terms of its long um, arc, right? Um, uh, for example, U.S. leaders have used overt and covert discussions of race to structure politics and governmental process, right? Race, class, gender, and ability coded languages have always been used as a means to, to achieve political gains on both sides of the political spectrum, meaning conservative and liberal. So I wanted to give you a kind of guessing game here of who kind of said the following, right? Uh, so first, um, we have uh, a statement by a founding father, right? Who says, to our approach, it must be said that th uh, though for a century and a half, we have under our eyes the races of black and of red men, uh, they have never yet been viewed as subjects of natural history. I advance it therefore as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance are inferior to whites in the endowments of both body and mind. This was said by Thomas Jefferson, right? So basically Thomas Jefferson is saying both um, African-Americans or African people and indigenous people are in, is, um, uh, inferior to whites, whether that be because they were uh, originally a distinct race, meaning that, you know that polygenesis theory or this idea that um, multiple races emerged at different points in time, or they kind of evolved to be different because of different times and circumstances. Next, right? I will say then that I am not, nor have I ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races that I am not, nor have ever been in favor of making voters of jur voters or jurors of Negroes, nor qual qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this, that there is a physical difference uh, between the whites and black races, white and black races, which I will never be, will, which I believe will forever forbid the two races from living together on terms of social and political equality. And in as much, as they cannot so live, while I while they do remain together, they must there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. This is the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln, actually evincing that he believes not only that African Americans are completely distinct and should never be equal to whites, so much so that they should never intermarry. Um, he also believes that white should always be uh, above African Americans or blacks in this case, right? And then um, Strom Thurmond, the, the leader of the, of the last standing segregationist party here in the United States, mentions here that here not in, here's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and, and admit the N-word race uh, 
into their theaters, into their swimming pools, into their homes, and into their churches, right? And so whether we're looking at the 1700s, the 1800s, or the 1900s, the long arc has always been about um, this positioning of, excuse me, African Americans or Black folks as inferior to whites, right? And so it's been a big part of this long-standing history. So what we have to understand is that racism manifests through various types of social fields because of this long-standing tradition of white supremacy and this long legacy of racism in our society. So this cartoon on the left, I think, greatly embodies this, and I'll kind of show you quickly over time. So um, what we can see here is there's a case with Bob, right? So Bob has, I'm sorry, Bob here has um, some immigrant gra um, great-grandparents who come to the United States and start to bill out the privileges of whiteness that actually are inherently beneficial to him or show that he's actually benefited from racism. So Bob's great grandparents got in the United States because the immigration laws only allowed the right kind of people to immigrate. When Bob's grandparents became homeowners, the bank lended to his grandparents rather than the people of color, right? So sorry, we can't help you. We're happy to approve your mortgage loan here. Bob's dad was able to get his career because um, the um, white employer favored him, right? You know, we want people like you in our company versus the uh, person of color uh, being denied the position. Bob's parents were able to become homeowners because they were able to, to access intergenerational wealth, um, i.e. that the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the realtor wanted to uh, sell to the right kind of people, right? And then Bob was able to uh, help or get his, um, uh, sorry, Bob's parents were able to, to access intergenerational wealth from their parents to help with a down payment. Um, when Bob was a kid, he got let off with a warning because of possessing drugs where the um, person of color was arrested. And so when Bob says, I've never benefited from racism, he has to understand that his great grandparents were able to get into the United States because of um, their whiteness, right? His grandparents were able to get a home because of their whiteness. His dad was able to get his career because of his whiteness. His parents were actually able to buy a home because of their whiteness, right? And he actually was able to escape being entangled in the criminal justice system because of his whiteness, right? And so realistically, and, and because of our, what we can clearly see is that he does have a sense of white privilege, that there is a sense of white supremacy here in our society. And overwhelmingly, he's able to access that um, intergenerational wealth and privilege because of his whiteness, right? And again and again, in all the other examples, right, people of color are not given the same kind of privilege, right? And so I show this model on the right here to, to really glean out the difference between race equity and racism. So when we're thinking about racism, we're thinking about discrimination, prejudice, prejudices, and stereotypes, which lead to unequal treatment, limited access, and disparities, right? So when we're thinking about where these come from, discrimination is based on values, beliefs are lead to these prejudices and assumptions-based stereotypes, right? And then attitudes lead to unequal treatment, behaviors can limit those access to, to certain things depending on the, the kind of framework, right? And then ultimately disparities, right? And so what are the effects of these, right? So the first, I wanted to talk a little bit about education. Um, a couple things that we can glean out here. Some of this we might have seen in the um, ethnic studies lecture, but I wanted to revisit it. Um, on the right, we can see the, the overwhelming rate of segregation in schools. So today on average, white students attend schools that are overwhelmingly white. So um, if, uh, if you take any school in the United States and, and you see that it's predominantly white, it's almost overwhelmingly white um, by a factor of 75% or more, um, where African-Americans and Latinos uh, go to schools that are pretty much 70%, 75 to 70% um, students of color, right? And within these schools, these schools are largely poor, right? So um, high... Um, high poverty schools are almost overwhelmingly black or Hispanic. So most of the schools that these students are going to are also poor, which means they're, limit, they're having limited access to um, 
after school programs, technology, um, uh, college preparatory classes, so on and so forth that can help them. And what we've seen is the growth of the prison pipe, school to prison pipeline. So here, um, over 57,000 uh, uh, people under the legal age of 21 are in the juvenile detention system. Many of those are people of us, uh, I'm sorry, students of color, um, almost 70% of all of the school suspensions are um, black or Latino. Uh, and 95% of the suspensions are for subjective, uh, subject, sorry, subjective um, infractions like talking back, dress code, and cell phones. I wanted to show this clip um, to really show what this looks like when we're talking about um, the differences in schools because educational disparities in terms of funding especially in these hyper segregated schools, which we're seeing more and more throughout the United States is really important for us to suss out because this is leading to a lot of other issues in our society. My name is Cedric Forte. I'm a junior at Heritage High School 425. Um, my name is Jackson Langort. I'm 18 year old and I'm a senior at McLean High School. Academic subjects, I'm in advanced placement literature, English, advanced placement, uh, US government, biology, and comparative government, art, advanced placement music theory, health, uh, geosystems for science, and um, men's course, leadership, and technical theater. Half an hour once school starts up next. For the fun of it, trying to park here, you come in at normal time, it's really awful. You end up parking like half a mile away. We should be able to travel for free. The kids here are motivated in just about everything. They're motivated to even learn, which is scary to hear for a high school kid. They're motivated to succeed in sports, extracurriculars, anything. I think they've lost the will to learn. A lot of them, they just like, don't find school interesting no more because they don't have the power to do anything. And you say so in the classroom. This is our auditorium theater. Uh, we have lights, standard light sound. It's not particularly high tech, but it's, it's we have a nice system. Here, through a metal detector. Like they use this to try to you know, keep school safe, but obviously it doesn't work because like even when someone walks through and it beeps, like they don't even search them or anything. They just say, okay, walk back through and be your pockets. That's all they do. This is our news studio. It's one of three high schools in the county who has it. Hey, orchestra, can you start playing? Well, one thing that these walls, like they really need to be repainted because of the graffiti. As you can see here, they tried to repaint it, but it doesn't blend in. You can actually tell they just like really just gave up on repainting the wall. So every teacher in this school buys their own school supplies. And it's actually very sad because like the school system should have money to, you know, provide for those school supplies for students, but they don't. And the teachers have to come out of their paychecks just to, you know, be able to support their students. Um, that's our observatory. It just, it's a giant dome with a telescope and you can see the entire sky from there. If every so, school in the country can be like McLean, I think it's really gonna increase standard of living. Uh, it's gonna make tanks a lot better. Obviously it's not fair. I mean, we have not even half of what they have. I mean, we're all students. Why should we see things they have? I mean, we're all trying to learn. We're all, we all wanna grow up to be something. So why shouldn't we receive the same advantages they have? I don't understand that. I mean, I think that's a great point and a good spot to end on this, right? Is clearly, again, as we're we're talking about like the story of Bob, as we're talking about this kind of long arc and legacy of racism in our society, it is borne out in the situation where uh, Heritage Foster High School versus McLean is very different, right? McLean has an observatory and a technical theater, and um, you know Heritage High School has literally just poorly covered over graffiti, right? And so the book doesn't kind of stop there in terms of the overall, right? We, steal, we see more and more of this with other examples. Um, so one of the things that is always glaring and always in, super interrelated with education is um, 
the criminal justice system and, and just the sheer overwhelming magnitude of how many people of color are in that system as a result of that. Um, so I noted the schools to prison pipeline here and I wanted to, to kind of explain it a little bit more in this next slide. So uh, we can see examples where black students are 1.7 or up to three times more likely than white students to be suspended, right? Black youth over represent are overrepresented in the juvenile justice system, right? You can see um, many, many cases where they're much higher in terms of their overall. Uh, there are 11.7 uh, 11, 11 times as many African-American youth institutionalized um, in this particular county um, compared to whites, right? Um, and uh, the overall prison population is much higher uh, the African-American prison population is much higher comparatively to whites. And what we see, in, and this was explained, shown a little bit in the last infographic, but I didn't really suss it out as much, but I wanted to mention it here, is that although men and women, right, have relatively high incarceration rates, men specifically, um, white men have a one in 17 chance of being incarcerated in their lifetime compared to Latinx and black men who have a one in three and a one in six chance. So that's pretty big. Um, disparity, disparity comparatively, um, uh, whites literally have are two uh, up to two and a half times less likely, or four and a half times less likely to be incarcerated compared to men of color. And I've, I mentioned this in one of the previous lectures, but I wanted to revisit it here in terms of their incarceration rates. Right. So what we see here on the right is plea offers for types of felonies. Um, white defendants overwhelmingly get more access to community service, fines, time served, or, or other kinds of penalties compared to Black defendants, where Black defendants are, are overwhelmingly getting more jail time in prison um, compared to whites, right? Uh, and then obviously, whites are getting less jail time or no jail time or much less jail time and higher rates, where um, African Americans are getting much higher rates of longer prison sentences over time, right? So this disparity in education is leading folks into the criminal justice system. And then when they're in the criminal justice system, they're much more likely to be convicted, right? They're much more likely to be sent to jail and to be sent to jail for longer, which is gonna make it harder for them to do a variety of things or just get a job, get an education, find economic security, so on and so forth, right? Which um, impacts politics. So as many of these individuals are incarcerated and um, charged with felonies, one of the first things that is revoked from them is the right to vote, right? Um, so what I put here on the left is um, um, uh, states with different types of voting restrictions to ba based on felonies. So almost every state aside from three have no voting restrictions. It's Maine, Vermont, and I believe Connecticut. Um, many of them, or many states, um, do not allow you to vote while in prison, while still with a felony uh, conviction, um, and even after you've been exonerated, right? So Florida, Florida, a lot of the southern states, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, um, even after you've served your time and paid all your debts to the state, they still deny your right to vote if you are a felon. Um, and here we can see levels of African-American felony disenfranchisement as of 2016. So all of these states that have high, um, these very harsh disenfranchisement laws or the inability to vote have high concentrations of African-Americans who cannot vote, right? So which is leading to those longstanding issues in voting. Um, likewise, we can see this with Hispanics in terms of their overall share of the prison population. They're much high, excuse me, African-Americans and Hispanics uh, per capita are a higher percentage of the prison population compared to whites. Um, and what that leads to is a diversity gap in politics. So um, of the presidency, it's been 98% uh, uh, male, I'm sorry, 98% um, uh, white. Uh, this is a little outdated because this is 2013, but it would be it's roughly the same, 98% male, uh, male in terms of um, vice president, right? Um, or yeah, uh, president and vice president. Supreme Court, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male. Um, uh, women of color and people of color, or women and people of color make up only about 10% of state legislators, um, comparatively, even though they make up high percentages in other states. Uh, in terms of Congress, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, both in the House and the Senate. 
part of the reason why this is important is that one, if you were folks are not in those offices, right? Your agendas do not matter. And if you cannot vote for your person, then essentially it will always be the same person in there. So think of it this way, right? If you cannot vote, right? You can't vote for a person who looks like you, who understands your experiences and can advocate for you, right? And so when white folks are in that office and they are following that same kind of logic that we saw with um, Jefferson Lincoln and Strom Thurmond, essentially we are prioritizing whiteness. And so because those individuals are not uh, concerned with or uh, making legislative policies to help people of color who are incarcerated, the cycle just continues, right? So whites are getting elected, they're only caring about whites and all the people of color who are in the trenches of the prison system and disenfranchised due to these um, various laws continue to be disenfranchised, right? Which is gonna create that gap um, in terms of politics with um, um, voting, I'm sorry, with representation and, or I'm sorry, with um, other aspects of our society. One example of that is with healthcare. So in terms of healthcare, uh, we can see real healthcare disparities in the United States for people of color. Um, even though we've had the Affordable Care Act and other advancements since the Obama administration, we have seen persistent issues in terms of healthcare access, and this has been flushed out a lot by COVID. So on the left, we can see the uninsured rates uh, for non-elderly individuals uh, by race and ethnicity in 2018. Hispanic and Black have the highest rates um, compared at, along with uh, American Indigenous and American Natives. Um, so the three of the you know, historically marginalized communities having high rates of uh, under insurance, right? Um, and then many of those folks are unable to access healthcare um, because of cost, other reasons, or no usual kind of source of care, right? So the same kind of idea um, you know, without a policy agenda and without people in place to make sure that folks are getting access to healthcare, um, they're actually having these poor health outcomes. Um, I show here on the top uh, childhood obesity rates um, for various communities across different age groups. Um, Hispanic and African American have some of the highest childhood obesity rates. I know this is an odd measure um, for healthcare disparities, but one of the things that we can think about, and we're looking at the bottom here, is um, the rates of segregation in the United States and the rates of, rates of inability to access food. So your ability to go to the Viking vault, for example, to get um, uh, nutritious foods you know, at free or, or low cost um, is a part of food insecurity, which is a plaguing issue across the United States affecting mostly people of color. And because of that, um, what we see is many um, youth of color I'm not able to access healthy foods and or recreational spaces, which is causing um, childhood obesity, which is going to link to other um, issues, uh, other um, chronic healthcare issues um, to deal with cardiovascular, physicality, so on and so forth. And what we can see here on the far right in terms of health disparities is that, right? So as we see in individuals unable to access healthcare, um, have these high rates of obesity or in a, unable to access healthy foods, they have higher rates of stroke, um, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, adult onset diabetes, uh, higher infant mortality rates. We talked about this last time, and then HIV infections, right? And to complicate this further would be COVID infections. And I think that's going to be one of the discerning measures of the way in which we think about healthcare today is that many of the communities of color who have been on the front line or have not had access to you know quality clinics and or hospitals have been you know not only contracting the virus at higher rates being hospitalized and dying um, as a result of this and again because there's nobody um, that are there's nobody in the political offices to advocate for them and there's not an educational system that prepares those folks to become a part of the civic community or even run for office we're seeing these greater health um, disparities right Linked to this obviously is housing. Um, and so again, I wanted to show the kind of rates of, um, uh, I'm sorry, the rates of um, segregation here in the United States. Uh, the orange and reds are the higher levels of segregation, but we can see you know, segregation across most of the United States, right? It's, it's pretty severe, especially in this kind of Midwest and Northeast categories. 
Um, this stems largely from a, a, a big perception that um, white folks don't want to live next to people of color. So in survey, in survey research um, by Maria Krizen in 2015, she shows that white folks, although say that they want to live in most mostly diverse neighborhoods, so about 40%, 46% white or, or over or um, on average, you know, racially mixed, they're actually living in much more racially isolated communities. So they're even though they're saying that they want to live in um, are, are wanting to live in communities that are less white, they're actually searching for communities that are mostly white and actually living communities that are mostly white. And this is also true for Latino and black residents, but in the converse. So um, black residents and Latino residents are also looking for um, racially diverse communities. They're looking for um, communities that are, you know, less, that less look like them or, or less, have less of their own populations. However, they're living in communities that are mostly black for African Americans and mostly Latino for um, Latino residents. And because of this, they're being um, exposed to much more toxic environments. So they're living nearer to toxic waste sites, almost 56% of the population living near toxic waste sites are people of color. Um, many of those folks are exposed to hydro, uh, um, higher nit nitrogen dioxide and or carbon dioxide. And many of those folks don't have access to potable water. I provided this cartoon um, from, uh, of, uh, from Michigan 2016. This is supposed to be about the Flint water crisis in terms of how we used to see um, the differences between white and um, you know, quote unquote colored drinking fountains. So this was uh, again, how we used to have racially segregated water fountains, um, whites having to drink from one kind of water fountain and African-Americans having to drink from another one, usually the African-Americans drinking from a much lower quality. Today, what it actually is, is that whites get access to clean drinking water where African-Americans get access to undrinkable water or this unpotable water. And I wanted to show this next clip on environmental racism that really helps us think about this. And I'll tie this back to what we've been talking about earlier after the, after the clip. Yeah, yeah, I get it. The environment isn't a person. How can it be racist? But the most basic pieces of the environment, the air we breathe and the water we drink, are controlled and designed by people. And people can be racist. More than half of all people who live close to hazardous waste are people of color. Floodplains nationwide have high populations of Blacks and Hispanics. Black children are twice as likely to suffer from lead poisoning as white children. This inequality is no accident. Pollution and the risk of disaster are assigned to black and brown communities through generations of discrimination and political neglect. Enslaved Africans were commodities partly because their work carried environmental risks that were unacceptable to whites, like exposure to heat, malaria, and mosquitoes. As Jim Crow laws created racial segregation, they also reinforced an environmental system that still disadvantages minorities. It's no wonder that black and Hispanic children have the highest rates of asthma or that hurricanes like Katrina, Sandy, and Matthew did their worst damage in communities of color. Rich white neighborhoods can update their water pipes, but not places like Flint. The Jim Crow laws are dead and gone, but the fact that people of color are still more likely to die from environmental causes is no accident. And so when we're thinking about this clip and we're tying it back to this idea of politics, of education, of the of the uh, incarceral system, what we're essentially seeing and saying is that um, this lack of political representation or this long history of racism that has denied people of color access to education, to politics, is now um, borne out in these um, very uh, deleterious environments where um, they don't have access to health care, they don't have access to housing, they don't have access to food, um, which is actually leading to there are greater rates of healthcare complications or health issues, right? And also premature death. And so as we start to close on this, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of racism because I think many of us are wondering what's next, right? And it is not gonna be that we will have this simple kumbaya movement, but rather we are going to see that these outright conversations about race, racism and race discrimination are now coded and masked or coded to mask the intention and effects, right? 
Um, what's akin to the possessive investment in whiteness, especially as we've seen in other examples, is this idea that um, we want to keep America a certain way, right? This make America great again, or, or keep America great. Um, or this idea that um, we have this uh, original social system that was quote unquote beneficial, but was only beneficial to certain individuals. And then now, because we assume, or because certain individuals assume that we live in a post-racial society, um, we should uh, return to, or nobody should challenge the ways in which the system is still um, denying people of color access to certain things. And so what I really want us to focus on here, and as, as we think about this critically, is how um, these new coded terms um, are actually utilized to uh, one, again, mask systems of discrimination, but also push back against individuals who are standing up for their rights. Um, if we go back to precious knowledge, we saw this a little bit with the attacks on um, uh, student organizers dressed as brown berets or in their bandanas, sunglasses, and berets as being quote unquote militant and that being illegal. When we also see at the same time today, individuals who you know literally took over the capital with you know weapons, bear mace, um, you know constructing gallows, so on and so forth, and that being a part of American patriotism, right? So. Um, you know, one is considered to be a, a revolutionary gangster and the other one is considered to be a revolutionary patriot. And what I've provided here is a kind of ver vernacular framework or this kind of linguistic framework. So what it's what we've seen evolve today is this new understanding of race along these lines where criminality and despicability are associated with certain racial groups. So African-Americans today are considered to be criminal thugs versus um, you know, just being black. So if we're, if we're talking about the denial of humanity to individuals, we're not doing it along a clearly race-based line. We're actually trying to criminalize those individuals. Um, with Latinx men, we're saying that these folks are illegal immigrants, right? Uh, and undocumented aliens or you know, um, illegal sympathizers versus being you know, human subjects. And then the case of Muslim and Arab looking immigrants, we see them associated with terrorists. And so um, a lot of times, and I think I've mentioned this previously, is this idea that, yes, we're not talking about race explicitly anymore, but rather we're associating with criminality, but a sen a sen in effect, we're still racializing individuals. We're saying that they're not human at the same level as whites. And because of their inhumanity or their less than humanness, that subjects them to a lot of mistreatment. And this construction of color blindness, essentially, is what we'll call this here, is um, you know it, what it does is it helps folks misdirect uh, and hide uh, larger issues in our society, like again systemic racism, so on and so forth, and then basically blames a subordinate group for its current circumstances, right? So it's not the fact that the criminal justice system is biased and overwhelmingly incarcerates people of color at higher rates than um, whites, it's, um, it's those uh, criminal thugs, they're doing the problem, right? It's not the fact that we have all of these issues with immigration policy, it's that there's too many illegals. There's, you have all these illegal invaders coming to our country, right? Um, uh, we don't wanna worry about the rising hate crime rates towards um, Arabs, uh, Arab and Muslim looking individuals and or um, Asian Americans, right? While well, Chinese folks shouldn't have brought COVID here or, you know, we always have to remember 9-11 and the terrorist attacks, right? So it's about this new kind of language that we're seeing emerge. And so I think this clip from John Stewart really encapsulates what colorblindness looks like and what we can, un or what we will begin to see as the future of racism in the U.S. What I think we need to take away from John's, uh, our John Stewart's example here, and, and what I've been trying to stress in terms of the future of racism, is that essentially um, we have this ubiquitous system of white supremacy in the United States, right? That it reaches across all of these boundaries. Um, there's denial of equal access to 
you know, kind of the goods and rewards of society for people of color in education, politics, housing, healthcare, um, criminal justice, so on and so forth. And what we've now evolved into is a system where um, we assume that there is no longer race, right? And that whenever we challenge the systems of white supremacy, um, you know, essentially whites or those in power will um, uh, charge either the individuals um, as, you know, deviant or criminal, i.e. these examples I've provided here, criminal thugs, illegal immigrants, or terrorists, and then, uh, or essentially argue that the system is not biased and that there are um, these uh, provocateurs um, within the various communities that are arguing race, right? This idea of pulling the race card. And the reality is that the, the data still across all of these um, categories, right? Economics, politics, um, labor, um, criminal justice, so on and so forth, always show that people of color are not getting the same outcomes as whites, no matter what the conditions are, right? Whether they're educated, whether they, they start out rich, whatever that looks like, right? Remember the last slide when I showed you the example of um, 10,000 black and white children from poor and from affluent communities and African-Americans almost overwhelmingly uh, ending up poor in that example, regardless of where they start out. And so that is what we see today is that we now have, again, this long arching history of racism in our society, the destruction around white supremacy, and then in effect, or, or who is mostly affected by that is people of color across all of these examples, right? So we'll leave it there uh, for today. So we've covered the cycle of white supremacy, um, the legacy of racism, how it manifests, right, with our little cartoon example, and then the various effects of racism across education, criminal justice, politics, healthcare, and housing, right? And a little bit on the future of racism in this understanding of colorblindness. Again, this is only a beginning part of this, and we'll see this a bit more as we talk about um, the four historically marginalized community in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we'll really get into the weeds on how this looks uh, or how this is affecting each of these communities today. Um, and lastly, our key term for today is white supremacy. Um, and I provided an example earlier. Okay, so hang on to this because this is going to be important for your first reading reflection that's already been posted. It's online. I will give a video explainer of that um, later this week. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me.